Okay, we're good. Hello, hello, everyone. This is the Montessori Show, the Fall 2019 edition with Simone and Nicole. We have a special guest today. Hello. Yes. So, Nicole, uh, we've invited uh, to have this topic this month about answering tricky questions that our little ones ask us. And what are proper ways to be authentic and honest and respectful. So I'm going to let Nicole and Simone kind of give us some guidance there. Um, and I will be the monitor and hopefully getting all your questions answered. And just, just to, to kind of introduce the topic, we just want to be clear that this is just our personal opinions how you manage your families, the stories, the traditions, all of that, that is your individual choice. And for me, it is such an important opportunity that we have to create the traditions that we want to. This is, we get, you know, we get to, to, to start over if we need to. So, you know, it's, there's no right or wrong way of doing things. This is just three Montessori guides having a conversation and kind of sharing how we would approach some of these. All righty. Simone, want to say anything? Hello. I'm just happy to be back at the Montessori show. And I love this topic because I like difficult things, you know, it's like, it makes life interesting. Yes, it would be straightforward if it was all very easy, but toddlers are great at asking difficult questions. Young children are as well. Um, so hopefully we can share some insight and I love that Nicole's joining us. Nicole, I just wanted to actually wait and say on the recording that I'm really grateful for your work. You're always making challenging our viewpoints and I'm really happy that you could join us for this conversation. Oh, thank you. That means the world to me because having challenging viewpoints can sometimes be a little uh, scary sometimes. So I appreciate that from you too. So thank you. I'm excited to, to have this conversation with you both. And um, welcome to Christy. She's drinking sparkling water. She's in Indianapolis with US. She's no children yet, just fascinated with Montessori. And Nicole, you wrote that you um, are drinking peppermint tea. And from Evergreen, Colorado, 45 minutes west of Denver in the mountains, there were 40 elk on our property yesterday. Wow, 40. Wow. That was amazing. The whole herd came through. And wow. yeah, it was very cool. Yeah. So I will just say uh, housekeeping please, when you come on to please be mindful to mute yourself. Um, you are more than welcome at some point when we open for questions to unmute yourself and um, either speak or put on your camera so we can see you. And we want this to be interactive, but just for the recording, if you can just be mindful to mute yourself. Thank you. Also, you're welcome to drop any questions for us into the chat box. We've had some people write in already and we've got some great topics to discuss, but we're also open to hearing what questions you have coming up for you as well. And hello to Steph in Northern California. Very fun. Okay, so let's, um, should we just get started with the questions that we do have? Mm -hmm. Okay, so the first question comes from us from Leah. And Simone, this might be, you might need to explain this a little bit to some of us who don't maybe know these traditions, but she says that she just received an invitation for the cinder claws uh, at the festivities at the daycare that my six month old daughter attends. It made me wonder what the Montessori approach concerning these traditional folklore characters is. Personally, I don't want to lie to my child about cinder claws, her father, though, is looking forward to starting to tell stories and sharing her fantasy stories. Please enlighten me. And um, I, so Santa Claus is like Santa Claus. So um, on the 5th of December, he comes, he actually arrives halfway through November and people, um, people, children can leave out their shoe and he leaves little shoe presents, like just small little tokens. Um, and he comes on a steamboat and he has some inappropriate black helpers which are now rainbow helpers. So they're starting to change some of the, you know, characters around it, but it's as difficult as Santa Claus really um, because there's mixed viewpoints. It's very much, 
even more than Santa Claus, the whole city's in on the deal. There's a whole parade where Santa, Santa Claus goes on his white horse through the city. And it's really beautiful and it's very much part of Dutch tradition. So how do you break that um, when there's almost like there's a Santa Claus journal, which is a television show where each day like Santa Claus is arriving and something happens with the presents. And um, so it really is like he's real. It's really hard to deny that Santa Claus doesn't exist. So maybe, um, Nicole, it's a good time to explain how like a toddler brain works and the difference between reality and fantasy. Would you like to tackle that one? Sure. Um, well, the toddler brain is, is, is based on reality. So if we tell them something, they believe it to be true. We have this like really high honor of um, giving toddlers information and the information that we give, whether it's fantasy or fact, all comes as fact to them. So like I talk about how, you know, with books, we want um, the child to be reading realistic books because if there's a bear sleeping in the bed, they think that bears sleep in a bed if we don't give them any further information about it. So I feel like Santa Claus kind of falls into this same thing where we're, um, I don't know, we have this great opportunity, I think, with young children to, as um, I can't remember which one of you was saying, you know, to start new traditions with their families. And so my philosophy on kind of Santa Claus, Santa Claus and is, is it Cinder Claus? Is that it? Like Cinder Block? Cinder no, with an S-I-N-T. Oh, okay. Gotcha. <laughs> um, you know, I, my philosophy is, is telling children from the start that it's not real. Um, but it's something that we celebrate. And, and that to me feels a little less, I don't know what exactly the word would be, you know, just a little more respectful of the child's brain at that point. Um, but that gets really kind of wishy-washy too if you're a family that wants to play into the fantasy and how do you find the balance between those things. But really what young children need is reality and they need truth and they need honesty from us. So that makes these kind of holidays a challenge to find a balance between the two. And I'm still working on it myself and how to, how to kind of walk that fine line between the families that I serve and the children that I serve. So. so, for example, what would you do if a family does celebrate Santa and you're telling the children that it's not really in your class? Is there a difficult conversation there or, or are all the families on board with your approach? So in my class, I don't feel comfortable saying whether Santa is real or not. I really allow, I think that's something that needs to be from families, um, especially if I hadn't have a conversation with a family. I feel like that would be a line that I would be crossing that is inappropriate. So, you know, with Santa and with toddlers, I really let them bring it up. And if they are talking to me about Santa, then I might kind of fill in some, oh, you went and saw Santa at the mall. Oh, did he have a white beard? You know, I may talk about some of the real concrete things for them because do they really also comprehend this idea that Santa comes around and gives presents to every single child on the whole planet and goes through your chimney and what if you don't have a chimney and all and toddlers brains aren't thinking that far in the future so i've found really great success in just talking about it if they talk about it i don't have books with santa claus out in my class um we kind of celebrate the season more than santa with the children so I'm not, I've never had a child ask me if Santa's real or not, because again, toddlers' brains aren't really there yet either to ask that kind of critical thinking piece. Um, so I haven't had to cross that yet. Um, but my, my, the information that I give to families is, hey, this is an opportunity to really start a tradition where you're kind of doing these traditions, but the foundation is still honesty with your child. So... Yeah. But it's and, a, and what it's, would you, what, how would you handle like this, that Leah, who is, you know, she's wanting to be kind of truthful in saying this is, this is a story. And then daddy is kind of getting excited about, you know, kind of sharing the, the, the fan fantasy part of it. So how do we kind of come to an agreement <laughs> that, you know, um, what what is what is like really necessary for the child to hear and to understand right 
Simone, do you want to take that? Do you want me to take that? <laughs> I'm, I'm happy to try. But I mean, I think this is like any difficult conversation because it could be about whether or not you put your child into time out. There can be differences of opinion between two parents. And hopefully you can have a conversation with them to say what's important to you and what's important to you. So you really like them dressing up in the, to go and see the parade and that's really important to you. And is there a way we can do that with truth and honesty or is it something that we're going to, yeah, am I going to maybe find an honest way like I'm not sure but Papa thinks that it's definitely real you know you can maybe say what he thinks and what you think and maybe that's for the child then to work out for themselves just as in different religions you know I'm Catholic and he's Protestant or he doesn't he's atheist you know it would just be that everyone has their own different opinion and you can decide for yourself when you get older um, Maria says for Santa she's planning this year for her two-year-old to have a Santa hat and we can take turns pretending to be Santa and pass out presents. We love imaginary things in our house, but we talk a lot about pretend versus real. So that's an interesting one. Um, I also have a personal story because my children are 17 and 18. And it was never really questioned in my community that Santa Claus would, should be questioned as a thing. You just went along with it. So I um, am putting up my hand to say I didn't know any better. So my children had Santa Claus. And... Um, then we moved to the Netherlands and then there was Sinterklaas as well. So we had to decide what are we going to do with Sinterklaas coming on the 5th of December and Santa Claus on the 25th and all of um, our families celebrate, you know, the Christmas traditions and as well as Hanukkah in there and then all of Sinterklaas. So it was kind of getting complicated. So we decided that Sinterklaas was like a cousin and that, you know, so we really elaborated a whole story so that they knew why they weren't getting presents in their shoes every day while the Dutch kids were. You know, because they would, they would otherwise be like, why did they get a present and we didn't get a present? It got right. really complicated, right? So anyway, when we moved to the Netherlands, a friend of mine said, around eight years old, they find out that Sinterklaas isn't real. And so I told them in the summer that they were turning eight, like sometime quite far from Christmas. And they went, okay, that was fun. I said, but it's a secret. So, you know, it's a secret thing. It's a special tradition that we try and keep for the younger children. They really like to, you know, believe in the magic of Christmas. So we're not going to tell anyone we will continue this tradition in a you know way. And then apparently my daughter went to school the next day and told everybody and the teacher <laughs> had to pull her aside and tell her not to. Like children just can't not tell the truth, I think. So it was just, um, yeah, she thought she was in on the big secret and then got told that she wasn't allowed to tell everybody. Yeah. And, that, and that's a tough one too, because, you know, if we are a family who are saying to our children well you know it's it's a story people believe it or or and and you know then then they kind of mess it up for the other families who really want to go full in so that's a tricky one well I and i think that, oh sorry, sorry. <laughs> go ahead, I saw what you were saying about talking over each other um and i think that if we completely take these celebrations away i worked at a school where there was no talk, nothing allowed as far as Halloween, Christmas, Thanksgiving. I mean, all the holidays were just like, you don't talk about it. And to me, that's almost feels just as confusing because then you have a child who's experiencing this everywhere else in their life, in the grocery store, you know, at, at shops, when Christmas comes around, you know, it's Christmas. And then if you walk into school and there's nothing and no one's talking about it, I feel like that can be really confusing for young children also. So it's, it's again, kind of finding that balance between, between both sides. And Simone, I liked what you said about kind of letting children choose for themselves too, that this isn't a concrete set in stone thing. And we can have differing opinions, even within the household that we can talk about and allow the child to kind of find their own way through these traditions that we have established because Everyone celebrates different. Everyone has different traditions for all of these. And what a beautiful opportunity to really create your own with this mindfulness of what the child needs and what they're ready for. And sometimes our nostalgia can, can make us give children things that they're not ready for quite yet, you know? Yes. And it's, it's yes. this like understanding that we can wait and we can do some of these things along the lines of Christmas, maybe when they're a little bit older and they can understand it. And when they're toddlers, we keep it really simple and not overstimulating and, and still like, I love the idea of wearing a Santa hat and giving out presents. How great is that for a toddler to do something that feels like they're being this, you know, contributing member of the house. I think that's a lovely way to kind of find a way to celebrate without it going too deep 
too soon. And I think you brought up a really good point is about the, the kind of our, our nostalgia of, of, you know, childhood and the fantasies and everything. And just a reminder that the, the fantasies or the, you know, the, the traditional stories and all of that are fabricated by adults. Like it is, it is very, you know, adult driven. The children, you know, like Nicole said, are in the concrete, are in the reality, at least, at least under three years of age. And so it's really important to, to be mindful of that, that it's, it's, it's a need for us, but not, not necessarily for them. So, yeah. I've got two things that I want to add to this before we move off from Santa Claus and these um, traditions. Mm -hmm. Fantasy, yeah. Um, One is, is that I think you can still have fun without, there still could be magic around the season. So Nicole touched on that. So I think sometimes that we sound like this wet blanket, like no Santa Claus. And then it's like no No. fun allowed. And one story, and it's not that. It's just like, we're trying to present honesty, you know, to not tell lies to our children. Because how do they pick up whether to tell the truth? That's because we're being truthful to them. And we, like, what we say to them is like, be truthful, tell the truth, don't lie, this kind of thing. Actually, our example is more um, important than actually what we say. Do as I say, do as I yep. do. <laughs> but no, the other way around, we want to do as we also say. Um, the second thing is, is, so what if someone who's listening, they might have a six-year-old child and they've been saying that Santa Claus is real and now they've changed their mind. What would you do then if you wanted to go honest oh that's a good question i haven't thought about that i'm sorry i didn't catch the whole question simone can you oh okay you're okay yeah so what if for example someone listening tonight has a six-year-old child and has been having santa claus or santa claus and now they've decided actually yeah i do want to be honest i feel uncomfortable now maybe going along with this ruse it's not a ruse it's like a tradition um so yeah what would we say to the child and i think it's probably similar to what you tell a child that's finished um that is you know that is growing out of santa claus but it's a good i I would i would start honestly by asking the child what they believe yeah to see where where they're at because i remember very distinctly there was i i totally went into the whole christmas santa claus thing so i well i have a 23 year old and a 19 year old and i you know i played the game and uh And I remember one Christmas, my youngest, you could feel sense that he knew something was up, but at the same time wanted to go along and play the game because what if he told us he knew then maybe, maybe he wouldn't get anything like it was this. So for me, it would be really, you know, like, say, what, what is, you know, what's your take on this whole thing that's going on these days in Santa Claus and see where they're at before you kind of, you know, be the, the bearer of bad news in a way. <laughs> right. And what a great opportunity to like bring out some maps and talk exactly. about, you know, like bring exactly. some logic to it a little bit for the child right. to sort of figure out on their own. Perhaps. And the different traditions yeah. around the world and, you know, what Santa Claus looks like different places. But yeah, I would definitely start by seeing kind of gauging where they are in their belief about it you know if they've already suspected something's up then you can you know be be truthful there but um just be sensitive to where they're at yeah and i think that it's also to be honest is like you know i i would probably time it not right now like just before the whole season but again like more in summer when it's not a you know something that they're really looking forward to to kill that thing you know to time the conversation to be at the time of year and then to say you know um how we've always had santa claus and then you could say we were making going along with the tradition of this the santa claus is real and now i realize that that actually feels dishonest and i want to tell you the truth and that's actually like putting up your hand because what if they've ever told an untruth you're just modeling this is how i would apologize i'm sorry that that and now i think we don't have to take away the magic because you're still going to make presents and we can put a sack, but you'll, you'll know it's from me and from your dad or from your family or whoever gives the presents, you know? And I think it's just an opportunity to apologize and say, I got it wrong and I want to be honest with you. Mm. Well, and, and that, I think that's such a great opportunity to model that behavior. And I also think, you know, in presents, like when I look back at, cause my family celebrated Santa 
And I look back at some of the presents that Santa gave me and I think, mom, dad, you should have taken credit for that. Like that was really nice and very thoughtful. And then Santa's the one that got all the, all the regard for it. So I kind of love the idea of it, you know, being from mom or dad or from whoever, you know, is buying the presents for the child and kind of posing as Santa that take some credit. Sonia's, um, a psychologist. She's written in the chat room. She's from Texas, a graduate psychologist, but work as a Montessori toddler Spanish immersion guide and has a two-year-old daughter and apply the method at home since she's nine months old. And she says that her son's nearly 21. So we, like Simone, did the whole thing, footprints and following Norad. I don't know who Norad is. He continues to believe until he was 11. In my classroom, we dress the little tree together and talk about being kind to each other. Lots of grace and courtesy lessons throughout December. Wonderful. Yeah, opportunity. So we have a question that came in from Danny, uh, and she is in Romania, and she is a three to six guide and wants to know how do we answer the question concerning God? That's a big one. Right? <laughs> Let's go there. <laughs> Let's go there. <laughs> yeah, and I think it's uh, like um, we were talking about death in a workshop in my classroom, which I would answer with the same thing is like some people believe this and some people believe that, you know, there's no scientific proof that we know of to date of which is the truth. And you can, we'll be here to, you know, they said, this is what I believe. This is what, you know, so you can also talk about it in that way. Because um, I, I think it's such a personal, personal thing. And these days, I know in my classes, I have so many um, people who are married to someone from a different background. So there's often a different religion involved as well. And you want to be respectful of all of those. And like John Marie at the very start said, respecting everyone's traditions and making your own new combinations and how you're going to handle these. And to me, this is also, again, you know, just like I was saying about where to, to kind of gauge where they're at is again, just what do you think? Like what, you know, and have a real conversation because to me I'm I'm a firm believer that 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 children are so you know so much more aware and and capable than we give them credit for and that so if we start really having a conversation about you know well what what do you what do you think what do you feel and this is this is how I feel this is how I was brought up and you know other people may feel differently this is something that we get to choose what we believe and such. I mean, that would be how I would approach it. But then I'm, you know, I was brought up with, with no um, organized religion. So it's, it's, you know, it's, it, that's the background that I bring. Um, I, Sonia has, oh, Sonia's very helpfully no, just quickly added no. that NORAD is part of NASA and they have a Santa tracker so you can see where he is in the world. Oh. I didn't know that. So thank you for that. And Nicole, <laughs> yes, going back to the... Well, and I was, I was just, you know, thinking about the difference of the brain from after three and before three. So I don't think I've ever had a toddler ask me about God. I've right. had children talk to me about church. I've had children talk to me about prayers. Um, but I haven't really had to address that. And I think that, you know, that three to six age, they're so curious and they want to know what we think so much. So I think it's important to, yes, share what we think, but not too boldly because I, I, you know, children, you know, Maria says children become like the things they love and they love us. And so often they want to be like us. But my goal is for children to have that critical thinking and to be able to see, you know, like so-and-so believes this and someone else believes this and my family does this and I'm figuring out where I am in my relationship with a God or no God or whatever it seems to be. So it feels just important to, to continue to foster those critical thinking skills for children. That and I think it will also depend on the choices that parents make as to where they enroll their children because there are some Montessori communities that are based in, you know, they, they do religious traditions and so on. And, and we even know that there's a whole Montessori training for, you know, catechism of the Good Shepherd. And so it really depends, I think, where, where the parents are, where the school is. If you are in a school that has no, you know, religious affiliation, I think that that's where you really kind of have to ask those questions of, what is it to you? What do you think? So that we can all really create our own interpretation of, 
what God, source, universe, all of that uh, can be. And just to, for those who aren't familiar with the Montessori philosophy on children from zero to six and with the conscious and unconscious absorbent mind, what Nicole was referring to about critical thinking. So from zero to three, you have an unconscious absorbent mind where you're just taking everything in like we talked about, like a sponge as reality, right? And taking everything, this is all true fantasy. And then between three to six, the children start to maybe sense, but then it's really not till six to 12. That's then the conscious absorbent mind where they're starting to say, why, why, why? But then really the critical thinking starts kicking in between six and 12, where they're starting to see the gray, like, oh, we go to church and they go to synagogue and they don't believe in God at all. Why? You know, like, and starting to see the gray areas. So it also depends on the age of the child, these conversations and understanding the child's brain and how they see the world, just in case anyone didn't have the background to do that. For that. So Danny has another good one for the two of you. Where do children come from? I love this question because I'm only just now becoming comfortable in really answering this. Okay. In a very truthful way. Yeah. Again, this is not a question that I get asked very much in my toddler environment. Yeah, I was just going to finish because she said she yeah. asked also what is the appropriate to answer and at what age and how many details to tell the children and is there a book that we can give more information? So, yeah. So you say you're, the toddlers don't ask you where babies come from? Yeah, not really. You know, I mean, toddlers are kind of, at least my experience with toddlers, I've not had this direct question, but I would imagine that parents get this, especially when um, mom's pregnant. Um, and, and that starts to ask, you know, to, to bring out some of these more questions about what's going on. But I also think toddlers, again, don't really have the consciousness to understand, like there's a baby in there and why is there a baby in there or how did it get in there? That seems kind of like an older question, but I think it's a great question to start preparing yourself to answer for as they get older. Um, so I'm a really big proponent of giving children concrete terms for our body and for the way that our body works. And I'm looking up right now because my friend Ashley, who runs this great site called Diamond Montessori, um, she's got a phenomenal book list um, for children uh, for just about every subject, especially some of these challenging ones. And I know she's got a book um, that shows images of a baby in a uterus and talks about how, you know, how everything works, but in very simple language. I think the worst thing that we can do is say that the baby's in our stomach because it's not. Food goes in our stomach and that's really confusing if we're telling children one thing and then another thing. Um, I don't think that we need to talk to toddlers about sex or intercourse, but I do think that we can talk about the body parts that, um, that we all have and which body parts. I don't, yeah. <laughs> so. No, and I would tend to agree yeah. with you because I actually have a vivid memory of a book where do babies come from? Mm -hmm. And it was, it was these paper cutout images, but it was flowers, birds, dogs, humans. And it was just like where babies come from. Like, and that was it. And to me, it just was just everybody, you know, had babies different ways. And that was fine. Like it was, um, and, and I do remember my mother being very, you know, using proper terminology and, and everything. And I think it is important. Danny did add that uh, her child is four, uh, four and a half, and um, that they are asking these kind of questions. So for me, it's really about being very truthful and giving, you know, like Nicole says, it's like, you don't need to go into in-depth details. You just, you know, this is, it takes two humans and it takes a sperm and an egg and, and, you know, we, we make love and we have babies and, and, and that's it. Like it, it's so natural. Um, and I will add that I was fortunate enough a few years back to um, observe a home birth, and I was asked to come to this home birth to care for the toddler who was the older sibling. And it was just beautiful to see how natural it was for her. She would, you know, say, let's go check on mommy and then let's go for a walk. Let's go to the park. And it was just 
part of, you know, an event. And for weeks afterwards, she imitated mom pushing and, and, you know, all of this, but it was just such a natural thing for her to just be aware of. So for me, it's just, you know, it's just being truthful. It's not the stork that, you know, delivers the babies, that their babies aren't in cabbages and all of that. Yes, Simone. Okay. So I also live in the Netherlands and they're very matter of fact. And okay. so I think that that is really, you give age appropriate um, responses. So like you say, for a toddler, it would just be that you have two parents and they make, you know, they make a baby. You may say they make love, but actually they're really just quite matter of fact. And I walked through the red light district and I'd already had the conversation with Oliver when he, by the time he was seven, um, about what sex was. Um, and so he was probably 10 at the time. And he asked me why the ladies in the red light district were standing in the windows with their underwear on. And I really just had to go there. I really had to explain that these are, are called prostitutes and you know how we talked about sex and how it's usually between you know two people who love each other very much sometimes people don't have a partner and they pay for sex and these are the women who you know provide the sex that's the job that they do and then we often we went into a whole conversation about where these sometimes that that wasn't really their choice that they didn't want to be in prostitution here in the netherlands it is quite regulated but it's still not usually a vocation of choice so we talked a little bit about that, but it's really just being very honest and manufacturing. She's like, okay. And he just walked on, you know, so I'm being as respectful as I can to everyone's choices and um, just saying it as it is. So I hope that's helpful, Danny. Just, you have to be feel comfortable with how much information you want to give. You don't have to give too much, but I also had um, a three and a half year old who was very articulate, knew every body part, could probably explain the whole birthing process to you. So you have to also see what that, child's intellect like as well so some children will really want to go there and really be open to hearing about it and they like any under six they're just taking it in as fact they're not really questioning it so much so be truthful as much as you can and i think that it pays off um do you have anything else nicole about sex positivity that you know i just i think that starting these conversations young by giving you know correct terminology for body parts um, and answering questions when they come about honestly and truthfully, because the worst thing that we can do is not answer a question and have the child kind of left there hanging to figure it out on their own. And that can be kind of confusing and almost scary if you're not getting information from the adults that you trust. So having those conversations from the start, making sure that you know, you're using this language, answering questions. And if you don't know, or you don't feel comfortable saying or talking about it with the child to say, Hey, I'll get back to you on this or something to be able to pause so that you can kind of collect yourself also, and then come back to it and answer it. Once you feel like you have the right tool or not the right tools, but once you feel like you are confident in having that conversation with the child, because we don't need to have these conversations immediately too. Oh, okay. They're asking about this. I'm going to do some research and figure out how to answer this in the best way. Possible. Yeah. And, 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 and I like your point, Nicole, about also for me, it's really checking in with yourself. Like if this is going to make you super uncomfortable and this is not something that, you know, was part of your upbringing and all of this, like maybe get some, get some assistance. Like, you know, oh, let's go check with, with, you know, maybe your girlfriend, you know, is, is, is just more comfortable about talking about things like that. Like, I think we need to also just get support. Like if, if we, if you check in with yourself and it's like, oh, I don't, I don't want to have this conversation, then, then there's something there and you need to respect that. But for me, it's the honesty that you're going to give to the child that is the priority. So if you need help or it, like Nicole says, you need time, maybe you need to go get some good books or something to help you along, then do that for sure. Okay. I'm gonna I'm add some, oh yeah. Sorry. Nicole, you get first, I'm, putting the, the, I'm putting in the um, comments, the book that I was talking about, it's called What Makes a Baby by Corey Silverberg. Okay. Um, that's the one that my friend recommends. And it's got really they're almost a little cartoony, but I think it's kind of a nice way to start the conversation. So something worth looking into to kind of help prepare yourself. Okay, we'll add those to the show notes. Um, Great. Thank you. Yeah. 
There's actually a beautiful book that I was given by a Dutch mum that was used to be hers, and it's about this big. It's really big, and it's got like a baby inside the uterus growing at the different months, and then the very last month, it like the baby comes out. Um, I don't have the title, but it's if you can find very visual books, it makes it much more concrete as well. They can see this is the size of mummy's belly, and this is the size of the baby. So that was kind of also really interesting. The other thing I wanted to talk about, which is for older children, but I'm just going to put it out there, is to actually teach children about respect and consent, um, you know, about touching other people, getting permission to touch other people, um, because that comes into sex later. And also that sex is okay for pleasure as well. It's not just about making babies, because any book that I read when I was a kid was just that you have sex to have a baby. And then you get this warped idea that sex isn't allowed to be for pleasure. So I think that's actually also really important to maybe mention as they're getting between six and 12, to, that might be in the conversation about sex in your house as well. Definitely. Yeah. <laughs> and consent starts as, at birth, essentially, you know, totally. we practice this telling children, I'm going to wipe your penis now. I'm going to wipe your nose. I'm going to wash your hair. Can I have a hug? All of those things are, and it doesn't seem that big at the time, but they are really prerequisites for sexual relationships later on and healthy sexual relationships. If you're able to kind of understand and have this consent and also respecting a child's use of the word no. And when they tell you no for something, if we're always kind of diminishing no, how is that gonna factor in later in their life when they're with other adults and, and not able to, you don't have trust in that word, I guess. And that's a big, the, the no is a big can of worms that I could have opened there, but I think it does factor into the consent piece on that. So I really am glad you brought that up, Simone, because I think it's an important piece. And we practice that in our class all the time, every day. Can I hug you? Can I give you a kiss? Those are the kids, you know, this is me helping the kids understand this language too. Um, so I like that a lot. And going on from that, I think we can also model consent because sometimes you have really huggy children, children who want to hug other kids and you can just say to them, oh, do you want to check with your friend that it's okay that they want to hug, particularly when you see the face of the other kid like looking quite frightened. So you can translate for these two toddlers or two children and that's how we ask consent, you know, to hug another child. Um, that can also be really nice. Um, so these are things, um, we also had a consent thing come up in our house because um, I have a two kids who like to do rough play right and i think rough play is really important but at a certain point one kid often wants to stop but no 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 they're kind of getting tickling and they're saying no 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 no. so we came up with that stop was a word that was a really clear like i'm not having fun anymore and then i could help them with that because i could say oh i heard someone say stop if i can hear them still rumbling um and then it would immediately stop so it was really really clear we never had any issues with it and it was teaching consent um the other thing I could say is I could hear someone not having fun and I could say, do you need to say stop? And then they go, stop, 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 stop. Yeah. So it's like you're practicing. So think yeah. about consent all the way through. Yeah. Right through from play fighting through to conversations about sex to changing a baby and getting their permission before you pick them up and hug them. Yay. So I have a question for um, the both of you. This comes from a mom who has a two and a half year old. Uh, no, older, I have two boys, one five-year-old and the youngest two and a half. And I need advice regarding the youngest one, two, two and a half. So they got an encyclopedia of anatomy, very interested with the anatomy and such. But also, since then, he became aware of his body. He has become very tactile of his genitals, particularly his anus. Now he walks around most of the days, uh, not at the nursery, but at home with his hand in his trousers. So she wants to know what is the best way to really canalize this curiosity with and, and you know, slash new habit uh, without, you know, making it into something bad or twisted and, and all of that. So um, you might have some of these people in your classroom, Nicole, and how do you deal with that? Well, and the, the last thing I ever want a child to do is feel shame exactly. in relationship to their body. So um, these, I absolutely have children who 
where is, you know, learning where is it appropriate to touch and explore your body and where do you need to kind of keep your hands visible in a sense. So, so I have children that, you know, if they are in that exploratory phase of their body, I'll just say, Hey, that's something for the bathroom. You're welcome to go in the bathroom and do that. Um, and kind of put a boundary there. And then if it happens outside, whatever space or wherever that kind of privacy lies, is that, hey, your hands are in your pants, you gotta go wash them. Hey, your hands are in your pants, you gotta go wash them. You know, and we do this, I kind of do the same thing with hands in the mouth, hands up the nose, is that I kind of just kind of re- iterate this, like, it's not, uh, don't touch your body. That's gross. It's more, Hey, your hands are in your pants and you know, you've got some germs there. So we got to go wash them and then let's move on and get your hands busy into some kind of work. So you're not as prone to doing that. But anytime that a child's doing something such as that, I think the most important thing we can do is give them a safe place where they can explore their body. And so in the home, that's going to look different from the school. Um, but, but being able to explore your body is so important and being comfortable with it. Uh, I also feel like sometimes children do that a lot. We'll touch their genitals more often if they've got like an infection going on that maybe we can't see on the surface. So if it's something that becomes chronic, I think it's also worthwhile to kind of see is there something going on where they're uncomfortable too. And then um, parents are uncomfortable with it, right? And so they get a reaction and then it becomes kind of interesting to see what the reaction of the parents is. So um, I was speaking about it with a parent in my classes and I said, it's just the same as saying the cracker stays at the table. So literally her dead kid got up from the table and I said, and we say, and the cracker stays at the table. So I would just say, and we do that in the bedroom or we do that in the bathroom. It's exactly the same tone. You should have the same reaction and you can practice it. Of course, you might be triggered the first time, but you can always then think, how can I handle this next time in a more like relaxed way, matter of fact way, what am I going to say? So they're really useful words. Thank you, Nicole. Yeah. yeah and I like, and I like the, the way that Nicole has put it, where it's just, you know, it, like it, there's no wrong or, or bad of doing it. It's just the consequences. You need to go wash your hands. Like that's just, that's just part of it. It's just, you know, oh, I, I see your hand is in your trousers. Like, let's go wash your hands because that's what, you know, the mom was saying is she's tried to explain and stories and bacteria and all of this, but um, that's, it's just, it's just a matter of fact of, of, you know, when we do that, we wash our hands and, 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 that's and if we, if we make it something too big, then it becomes, I'm getting attention from this. If exactly. I put my hands in my pants and mom's giving me all this information and talking to me about it, this is great. I love talking to mom. And what so, I like, and what I like about this though, is that the child is doing this only at home where they right. feel, where they feel comfortable doing it. So to me, that's also saying that, you know, they, they also have gauge where it's appropriate and not because they are, you know, she says they don't do it at the nursery. It's just at home. So um, I think, you know, honestly, for me, uh, fancy is, is the name of the mom is, is it's a phase and it will pass. And to me to, to not make a big deal about it and, and definitely no shaming or or you know that is something wrong it's just you're exploring your body aren't you and when you do that it's it's good to wash our hands and that's it like be very matter of fact about it yep thank you now, i must say that the chat room's been very quiet so we're either, either flooring people or um is this useful so maybe so just drop us some notes in the chat box to check <laughs> you're still with us um but we've got lots more topics to cover, so don't worry. Let's move on. If you have any questions coming up, thanks, Danny, for example, for your questions. Please feel free to pop them in. We've got a great group in there. Yes, okay. and if you do have a question, you know, either raise your hand. I know you can raise your hand or just unmute yourself and, and let us know. I've made it so that people coming in are muted automatically, so you just need to unmute yourself. Um, but I would, there is on our list of questions, um, is for children, young children whose uh, parents or families might be same sex parents, might be um, just different, maybe, you know, different races and such. How do you explain to the younger child who is asking, like, you know, if maybe it's uh, two, two men, two daddies, like, where, where is so-and-so's mommy? How do we, how do we, uh, talk about that to to our younger children. 
So again, I'm just very matter of fact that families can come in different ways. There can be two mm -hmm. mummies, two daddies, single mom, single dad. Um, and they can be from different races and just treating it very normally. And then they might ask more questions or not. Um, but it's again, when we kind of start to react like, oh, I feel uncomfortable with this question. And they're like, oh, why is that? So that's why I find it really important when we are being our example on the streets of, you know, seeing different cultures and they're picking up our example of how we speak about other people, about our neighbors and those kind of things as well. So I would have exactly the same situation, um, you know, talking about, you know, families that are made up differently to our own. And I think it's, I think it's really important. There are so many great books now uh, of different family structures that, you know, I think initially these books are made and, and thought of for children that do have two moms or do have two dads. I think it's really important to have these books in your home, even if you are a kind of a more traditional male, female home, to have books in your home about two moms and to have that um, image be something that your child sees kind of from the start is super important. Um, I think that, you know, this conversation when I first started teaching was very new. When I trained, we learned a different song every day that we could then bring back into the class. And one of the songs that we um, learned that I sang in my class for years was about moms and dads. And it was, everyone has a mom, everyone has a dad. And then you sang about the parent's name, you know? So it would be like, Nicole has a mom, her mom's name is Bobbin. And then you go around. And it wasn't until I had a little girl start in my class who had two moms where I was like, oh, this song doesn't work. And so we started singing about parents, but then I had a child in my class who didn't have parents, who was being raised by a grandparent. So, oh, this song doesn't work now either. So now I sing it as everyone has an adult that loves you because that's the truth. You can't really deny that, you know, every child has, has someone that they love. So, you know, kind of changing our language around, I think is important also in that sense and not assuming that every child comes from a family with a mother and a father, because that's not the case. Yes, it takes a male and a female to make a baby, but that after that, it can look so different. And I think what Simone was saying about being really matter of fact, she's got two moms, she's got a dad, she's got grandparents raising, you know, there's all these ways that we can answer these questions without making it too big and confusing for children. Yeah. And I think also what that whole story about how it evolved in your singing time is how it's happening. Stuff is changing. We're more aware of differences and that we were actually, yeah, not being respectful to all the different types of families and having to change things. So um, I'm finding that all the time that 10 years ago, if a child, actually, this is quite a good thing, like wanted to wear a dress and we were having like, not really sure what I would do if a boy wanted to come to class in a dress. And now it would be like, of course, come to class in a dress. But at the time it was really like, I, I hadn't had that situation before. So I'm also just learning. So don't think like, oh, I should have done, been doing it differently. I've done it all wrong. It's like, we acted the best we could with the information we had at the time. And you can still make the choices to, yeah, to say it's wrong or right. But I really like to just say that everyone's choices are okay. And then your children will pick up that understanding acceptance of everybody. So there's some questions that came in and I would like to invite uh, Danny to unmute herself if uh, you can, or I will unmute you. Because um, you ask also how to train my team in how to say and when to say appropriate things. So Danny, are you, you are unmuted. I think, meant, I think she just meant that she was learning the words so she could train them. But Oh, I see. Right? Okay. 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 So the other question we have is um, how to deal with children in the classroom who cannot control their intrinsic impulses, who constantly seek out boundaries. And when do you decide to seek external help in a Montessori environment if there has been no normalization for some time? So that I would need a little bit more details to answer that but uh simone do you want to try to answer this one about well, just boundaries just boundaries yeah in I general think back, yeah i think it goes back to observation and to seeing how we're all working together in um the classroom together um i really try not to ever have to 
dismiss, I've never had to send away a child from our class. Everyone is accepted um, because there's some children who um, move very fast through my classroom. Um, they do drop things, they um, are more explosive. Um, and I'm just there to be the best support I can to them. Um, I guess I'm also working with parents in my classroom. So I guess the challenge would be is at what point can you not actually cope? Because if it's going beyond your limit, then maybe there's a, maybe to get an assistant and that might cost money and how that is all managed. But Nicole, have you ever had the situation where you've had to um, get external help for a child who isn't respecting class boundaries? You know, I haven't, I, I, I've not had to go that far. And I think that, you know, I, I, two things come up when I read this question is that one, you know, children that are seeking boundaries often probably don't have them in other facets of their life and are looking for that kind of feeling of safety, because that's really what boundaries create is a feeling of safety for children when there's this whole big wide world for them. And we're kind of the railings on the bridge to help them cross without, um, without fear or with more confidence. Um, but that intrinsic, those intrinsic impulses that happen, I feel like, you know, for me as a guide, I'm there to help the child. So if I'm seeing that they're really struggling to kind of rein some of that stuff in, I'm going to offer my help. I see you're having a hard time keeping your hands to yourself. You're touching all the other children without their consent. Can I help you? let's go find something to do so that we're kind of helping them navigate and redirect from there. Um, but I've never seen it so bad where we couldn't handle it. I had a child that bit a lot and we ended up moving classrooms because we had more than one toddler environment and it just worked that he was biting the exact same child every day impulsively mm -hmm. for like months. Mm -hmm. And so we ended up kind of switching around classrooms. So they didn't leave the school. It was just a different environment. And as soon as they were in a different environment, they stopped biting. So um, I, I think sometimes we need to make changes within our own environments too, to kind of help those children that are, are having a hard time with impulse or are constantly seeking out those boundaries. Definitely, definitely. Um, so I hope that was uh, enough to answer Van, Van Harlan. Um, we have a uh, two more questions. Are you okay both going over the hour a little bit? Yeah, I can go. I've got until about two thirty. I'm going to look at houses. Okay. 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 Oh, nice. <laughs> um, this is about how do you handle a situation where other adults have reactions, like for you know, to reactions to masturbation or race or family, different to what you would have reacted, and then there are questions about those reactions and topics. So, you know, a child is witness to, to maybe a reaction that you wouldn't have had. How do you manage that? I love this question because it can be as simple as like, um, okay, just assume there's a mom and a dad in this situation. And you can just say like, daddy thinks that and mommy thinks that, and you think this, like, it's really, then you're acknowledging everybody's feelings. So it sounds like actually daddy's really uncomfortable with you masturbating or, you know, touching yourself or having your pants and pants. I, it's okay for me, but let's find a way that we can all have our needs met. Like, and you can have a conversation. He really doesn't want you to have your hands on your pants. And I really find it okay. You finding it really hard not to touch yourself. You know, it could just be a conversation like that because you're basically a family and you all have needs. And like, why is he uncomfortable with that? Or why are they you know, to actually see what is the root thing. And maybe it comes back to some shame, a situation that came up. And so they're not wanting that for their own child to happen, you know? So there's often root causes with why people are uncomfortable. Um, that's something that I would, that's how I would present it. Because if we just kind of say they're wrong, then we're not treating that partner in the same way that we would treat the child, you know? So I want everyone to feel accepted, including the person who maybe isn't, hasn't got their head around that it's okay to speak to a child about this in an honest way instead of, because sometimes it feels more comfortable to just kind of gloss over it or give a white lie, you know? Yeah. And to, and to, and to continue modeling, I think is really important in front of, you know, if it is, I mean, if it is within your home, that's one thing, but if it's, if it's out and about, I think it's okay to just come back and model what you want in because you're the parent like you get you get the last the last say i think in how you want to to share information with your child so 
And I think you can always come back to these situations, you know, thinking about, I think this is a great conversation for kind of the season with Thanksgiving in the United States coming up with um, the, the winter holidays coming up where we're with a lot of family and there are a lot of conflicting or different points of views. I um, recommend my families, especially when they start kind of the toilet, toilet learning process to send out a quick email to friends and family that they're going to be around of like, hey, this is what we're doing. This is the language we're using so that when we're at your house, you understand where we're coming from to kind of give a heads up and do some pre-work on things. And then I also think you can also always come back to conversations with kids. You know, for older kids, if there's a racist conversation happening around the table and you don't want to get into it with your uncle, but your child's sitting there listening, I think you can absolutely, after the fact, come back and say, hey, let's talk about this. Let's have a conversation where, where we're kind of hashing this out a little bit or if it's a yeah. family member that, that reprimands a child for touching themselves, then we can always come back and say, oh yeah, they got a little mad when you were doing that and kind of have a conversation post, post script about it a little bit. For toddlers, a lot of times once the conversation is over, it's over. Um, right. But it, it depends on the magnitude of someone's reaction. If it's a strong reaction, they may still be holding on to that a little bit. And we can have that conversation later with them when it's in our kind of setting and, and is a little bit, uh, makes it a little easier when not everyone's watching you too. <laughs> so we have uh, another question from uh, Mary who, um, she says, I hope this is an off topic, but she has a neighbor family who yell and spank their toddler, uh, who yell and spank and their toddler is obsessed with guns, superheroes and killing bugs all of which my two-year-old has witnessed unintentionally and was really disturbed by. So they don't have play dates anymore, but since they do live next door, they bump into them. Uh, and I try to be honest with my son about what he sees them do, but how would you recommend handling situations like this in the future with other families who parent differently than us? That's a big one. <laughs> it is. It's a big one. That um, is. And it's a hard one to, they live next door. It's not, it's hard to yeah. kind of separate from that. I mean, I think establishing what your household rules are um, and kind of reiterating those and just talking about how some people feel differently about these things. Yeah. yeah. In our it, home, it's important that, you know, we respect bugs and insects and in our home, we've chosen not to play with guns and, and some people do, and that's okay. Is it what you would choose? Yeah. Probably not, but it, it feels like a battle that I wouldn't want to step too far into also. Yeah. And kind of yeah. Keep the line. yeah. To me, to me, it's really, you know, and it goes back to how, what I said at the very beginning is we all parent differently. We all have our own values and I think it's just important to, to establish that. Whoops, somebody, I need to unmute somebody here. Um, it's really important to just establish that and that this is, um, you know, every family does things differently. And in our home, this is not something that we like to do. And I have, I actually have a personal story about this where I very, intentionally did not want to put any money into video games ever. And I did not buy any of the, you know, new things every year of the Xboxes and, you know, all of these things for my son. And I remember at one point he, you know, he asked like, why do my friends all have these things? And I said, well, that's just a choice that your father and I have made that we would rather spend our money in taking you travel around the world. And that's that's the choice that I've made. This is how I am you know, choosing to parent. And this is how we do it in our home. And that's really, you kind of have to set your boundaries and your values. And, and um, you know, I would definitely protect your child from, from seeing anything that's going to uh, disturb him or her, you know, next door for sure. And, and, you know, there's, there's, I know there's some neighbors who I didn't let my children house go to because I knew that the values didn't match up with with mine and and that's that's you know you make those choices for sure 
I think it's also really important to iterate though that we are really are an important influence in our children's lives. So they will go for play dates at friends' houses and they'll see things that maybe you wouldn't have exposed them to, but also know that they're mostly at your home and keep it, you know, I like to make our homes attractive so that most of the friends are coming over to your house to play so you see what's going on. Um, I also have a rule that you eat at the table um, in our house and that was actually really useful to get to know the friends that came through the door. Like I have teenagers and I know then more who's hanging out with my kids and yeah, so that's another way that you can kind of keep your ear out with the things that are going on. And I will, and I will definitely say that also what Simone just said about eating at the table. For me, as a family, we eat every meal, every breakfast and dinner together. And that to me has been so uh, important in, in, in catching those conversations and being able to answer those questions, like really always having a time of the day where you know you're going to be in a safe place and you're going to be able to ask these questions and you're going to be able to say, oh, you know, my friend so-and-so does this at his house or whatever. And we can talk about that. That's like super important for me. Yeah. The conversations with teenagers, we'll have to have a whole nother show on that, but it's really fun. And I <laughs> oh, it's so fun. It. Yes. <laughs> I like part part, more. part yes. of this work right now is, is kind of setting it up so that when with, with your young child now, you're having these little conversations so that when they're bigger and the big conversations come, you've established this foundation of trust where your child knows if I ask a question, I'm going to get an honest answer and a respectful answer out of the adult that I care and love for and how powerful that can be as they grow up in this very complicated and confusing world to know, you know, I've got dinner waiting where I can ask this question, or I feel safe asking my mom or my aunts or whoever it is in their life um, because you've already established this relationship. If you're trying to establish a relationship of trust and you haven't done it until they're a teenager, you're probably not going to get very yeah, far. Yeah, exactly. So this work with young children is so important in laying that foundation for them later in life, I think. And what's also really fun is I've often said um, to my kids, oh, can you tell me like what's happening these days? What do kids think about this? And they're the ones teaching me. So I'm asking them the difficult questions and then they're having to ask for them from me. Um, But they're lovely conversations. The other thing I think we've talked about is honesty. Um, And then there's this white lies. I also think that that's dishonest, you know, just pretend that you're four years old so that you can get into the museum without paying or the theme park. And we've got to be really careful and the little white lies, oh, I'm not going to tell them that I'm going to go tonight. I'm just going to tell them I feel sick. You know, they're hearing everything. So we're modeling honesty. And I've seen people say, I think that this is an appropriate time to tell a white lie. I don't think there's ever an appropriate time to tell a white lie. So that's a challenge for you guys to think that's about. Funny. That's funny because when you said that, I had a flashback of my mother asking me to answer the phone and tell people she wasn't there. <laughs> Oh, and that's she a good was one. standing right there, right? But it's like, ah. Uh. <laughs> so I guess that was a white lie, but. <laughs> we do have one more question in the chat box. Can we do that one? Sure. So this is a little bit uh, off topic, but I think it's a good one. It's a child who is constantly seeking attention. She can't work by herself. She always asks for hugs. So in parentheses, uh, she did have a difficult birth, premature, intensive care, and such. So, uh, Miriam, it would also be nice to know the age of the child today, um, so we can we can give a more appropriate response. But um, maybe Nicole, if you have a child who is in your environment who's always seeking attention, who can't seem to work independently, how do you how would you deal with that? You know. <sighs> It's so hard because I think att- attention, oh, she ended saying five years. So, five. so for me with, with the toddlers that are always seeking attention, I try to figure out how first how I can give them positive attention as much as possible because sometimes that child who is seeking attention can look for it in both positive and negative ways. So I want to make sure that I'm staying kind of on the positive side of things. And then what I try to do is kind of wean myself off of them a little bit. So we'll, we'll be working together on a puzzle and be very interactive together. And then I'll kind of move away a little bit. 
and kind of see if they can work by themselves. And I'll move away a little bit farther and just try to get it so that, yes, I'm still right there. They could probably touch me if they reached out, but I'm not right there on top of them and sort of kind of trying to pull away a little bit in a very gentle manner so that they still feel safe and they still know that I'm close by, but I'm not um, kind of feeding into this um, need for my attention constantly. This is very much easier to do as a guide than it is as a parent um, because they can pull on your heartstrings in a way that's very different from mine. So I think that's important to keep in mind um, in that fact too. And I also think it's sort of being conscious of your own boundaries because maybe you have given them a lot of hugs and you are supporting them because obviously they have had difficult birth and different things. You want them to feel nurtured, to start to heal some of these things. And sometimes it's going to be beyond what you can offer. So it's like, normally I, would, I can take the time and I can sit with you and hug. And right now I need to help the other child. Would you like to sit next to us? Would you like to read a book? I'll be available soon. You know, also just respecting that you can communicate when it is too much for you. Um, and it's going to be hard. Like a five-year-old will probably understand that more than a toddler. A toddler will still just be climbing on you because that's what toddlers do until they get all their needs met. So um, I hope that's helpful as well. Um, and I, do, I think we've just got a little bit of extra time. I'd love to cover a little bit about talking to children about death before we sign off. Do you think that there's time? Sure. Let's bring on a good, tough question for the end there, Simone. Yes, <laughs> Just... Well, to be honest, I mean, I do it as in a matter of fact way as anything else we've spoken exactly. about. Exactly. Yes. Um, you know, because unless you didn't know this before, we are all going to die. Um, and so it's the cycle of life. And there are, I think maybe we could also we look at Diamond Montessori and see if there's some books about it that, that recommend it. Or if you, Nicole, you might have some book suggestions. But there is a cycle of life about birth and death. Um, um, I had a really useful tip from a psychologist um, that you don't say passing away um, or that you, they're going for a long sleep because then they start to worry that anyone that goes to sleep could be dead. So that was really useful because I think I probably have said like, it's like having a long sleep. And then, but that association is too confusing for a very young child because reality, like we've just spoken about all um, for the call um, is really important. Um, so yeah. And then if they say where for the older children, where do you go when you die? And again, the same thing. Some, we don't really know. Some people think this and some people think this and I think that. Anyway, that's my quick question, my quick response. No, no, and I, and, I would, and I would agree with you. And having had experienced this because my mother um, passed away when my daughter was four. So we kind of went through it. And the beauty in that is that um, I actually spent the last summer with my mother and my, my two children. And every uh, nap time, they would, they would go and, and, you know, get on her bed and they would talk. And I think my, my mother really let her know what was going on, that she was dying and that she would, you know, go away one day and all this. My daughter was, was devastated when she died, but she was just a lot aware of, of what was going on because she had been truthfully told what was going on. It wasn't, you know, I'm not going to go take a long nap or whatever. It was, you know, I'm going to die and I don't know quite where, where I'm going to be. But, um, you know, she, she told us that she would always be in nature and that if we needed to talk to her. Oh, so long, Jan. Oops. We love you oh. too. <laughs> And uh, so, so there, and there are beautiful books. I don't remember the ones, but I know that that really helped my daughter also just to understand, like you say, the life cycle, the, 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 the cycle of life, you know, animals die and, and everything. So to, to just make them aware of that and expose them to it, I think is important. Yeah. Definitely. And I think if we're not talking about it, then when the big things do happen, when someone who is a staple in a child's life does die, it can be a lot more impactful in a negative way if we've had no conversations around death. Yeah. So um, I love pet fish for their lessons that they give us on death and the conversations that we can have with young children. I mean, that's the conversation around death that I've mostly had with, with young ones is we've had a fish die 
And, and yes, it would be very easy to just replace it with a fish that looks exactly the same and never have the conversation oh, and just have yeah, this yeah. perpetual beta fish that lives forever. <laughs> but I like taking the opportunity to have that conversation. Yes, our fish died and we loved yeah. him so much and we will miss him. And that's kind of the end of the conversation. Although I will say that I had a fish die when I was going through a death of a family member and I replaced the fish because I was not ready to have the conversation with the children because of my personal life. Mm. And I felt like it was going to be too big and right. I would probably lose it talking about this fish. And I don't want to scare children when it comes to death also. So it's, it's also kind of knowing where you are when you have these conversations mm -hmm. with children, but Insects are a great way to talk about death. When you see a dead bee on the ground or when you see an ant that's died, flowers, plants, all of this we see on a daily basis and how we can do that. And I love what you said, Simone, about not saying like they're going for a long sleep or they're lost or anything like that can, that can instill this fear in the child that, that, I mean, yes, death can happen, to, death will happen to them, but it's not going to happen because you're taking a nap or it's not going to happen if you get lost somewhere or something like that. So actually, I, I, I used the words passed away and passed away is like a euphemism. So actually be really clear. They died. That's yeah. the other thing as well. I think that's really interesting. Um, yeah. yeah. And also like uh, one thing I think that Nicole mentioned, and maybe you didn't pick up on it, the subtlety is like, say a dog passes away or a pet passes away. Often we want to cheer them up and go, Oh, don't be sad. We just want, we'll get another dog soon, you know, but actually what Nicole said is we loved that fish so much. It was like very special. And you just, the end the conversation there, you don't have to make it better. You can let them grieve. You can let them be sad, you know, it's, and then in time you might get another fish, another pet. And I, you bring up a very good point that, that grief is an important emotion to have. Like it's, it's, we don't want to deny anybody from having that, that, I mean, it's, it's part of processing it. So, you know, you're sad because the fish died or you're sad because the, the dog died and, and yes, I'm sad too. And, and I understand and, and that's it. Like it's, it's accepting also the emotions that go along with it are important for sure. And toddlers can be a little disarming when it comes to this because they are so good at being matter of fact. We had a little girl in my class whose dog was eaten by a mountain lion. Oh my goodness. And her, and we've got mountain lions where we live and she was so matter of fact about it and would come in and talk. My dog got ate by a mountain lion. And that was, this was her story to tell. And it was really beautiful to hear her share it in this way of feeling comfortable about it and also feeling a little bit sad, but it's also kind of a cool story because you know, it's just, it's, I love the way that toddlers can sometimes bring these, um, what for adults are very, can be very challenging and sensitive and they bring it to the table in this way that can be really beautiful and, um, and kind of change our thought process on it as well. So I think listening to the children and following them and their lead in, in their understanding of grief and death and all of these big feelings that I'm still confused about as, as you know, an almost 40 year old. So, yeah. So I think that's a great way to, to kind of wrap it up is that we just need to go back to our toddler selves to be able to talk to the children, right? Because they are so matter of fact and, and just honest with what's going on. So beautiful. Thank so you. I wanted to say a big thank you to Nicole because you are always, you know, have the words that we want to practice and hear about. Um, and so the more that we model these words for other people, the more they'll feel comfortable having these conversations with their toddlers. So I like the idea of being ripples and they become waves and more people will speak in this way to their children and then other adults and everything as well. Um, Nicole, have you got anything coming up that you'd like to share with um Oh, I do. I'm actually, because I love this Zoom format so much, I'm going to be launching a like mini toddler course coming up in 2020. So it's going to start in January. There'll be a lot of information about it on my um, Radical Beginnings 
Instagram page as well as my website, which is just that radicalbeginnings.com. Um, it's going to be uh, kind of a, I'm going to do a test in January. It'll be five sessions and it's for anyone working with toddlers. My specialty tends to be more towards teachers in a community because that's what I know and I do. However, it'll be open for all. So there'll be a lot more information coming about out about that soon, but I'm really excited to kind of offer another step for folks in their learning, especially if you're like me and you like this Zoom kind of format where you can see each other, which is what I really love about this. It's so different from talking on the phone and then I can serve, serve adults that are all over the world instead of just in my little community here in the mountains. So I'm looking forward to it. That sounds amazing. I'm going to sign up for that because you can Yay! always learn more, right? Everyone can learn more. <laughs> I'm always learning. I'm like a toddler. I just can't stop. I just want to hear more. Um, Mariam said, thank you very much. And Sonia said, thank you all. Very insightful. Marie said, thank you. Aiko, thank you. And thank you to everyone for joining us. Jean-Marie, always a pleasure to see you in San yes. Diego. Yes. Say good night here from Amsterdam. Any other things you wanted to share, Jean-Marie, before we jump off? Just, uh, just that if if some of you are not aware, I have started a podcast called The Art of Parenting. Simone has already been on twice, sharing all of her wisdom with us, and so that is a new episode comes out every Monday, and a special Q and A on the last Wednesday of the month, and that has been quite an adventure, and also just filling up my heart of, of the responses that I'm getting and just being able to share more information with all of you. So it's been wonderful. And you changed the name. You're going by your name now, yes, right? Yes, this is true. Yeah. This is true. I kind of uh, unveiled this week that I was uh, no longer working under Voila Montessori, but just my name, Jeanne-Marie Penel, uh, which to me was a big decision, but I think a good one in that it's not parenting is not you know about choosing one uh one principle or one philosophy montessori is definitely my foundation but there is just so much more that i want to bring in um that to me was a way to just broaden kind of what i share and so it's Jeanne-Marie Penel, your parenting mentor. So, yeah. I love it. Congratulations. And thank you both for having me on here. It's such an honor. And I love talking about this. So um, it just makes me happy to be able to share and to also know that the two of you are out there doing this important work also and serving families and children and in this manner because the world needs it. So thank you Definitely. for having me on. Definitely. Well, thank Maybe you, you can for coming back. <laughs> uh, anytime. <laughs> So Andrea said, thank you so much. And Shanta Ram said, thanks. Uh, it was great. Andrea, wonderful. And Antonella, thank you. Simone, do you, do you have anything you wanted to share before the end um, of the year? I am just enjoying hanging out with my lovely daughter in her last year of high school. So I have no big plans um, at this stage other than just continuing to spread lots of Montessori inspiration. You can always sign up for my newsletter because I write those quite regularly and We'll get you thinking, you know, about changing some of our perspectives about toddlers and um, being in the world with them. So hopefully that's helpful. Perfect. Well, thank you everybody for joining us and we will have the replay up on our YouTube channel shortly. Great. Alrighty. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye.